I am thrilled to sit down with Larry in the BlackRock offices to dive into his remarkable journey and hear his insights. Larry, thank you so much for being with us here today on the 19th hole. You, you've had such an incredible career. You've been instrumental in the creation of some of the world's largest markets, the mortgage securities market, securitizations generally. Barron's has named you as one of the top CEOs for an unprecedented 14 straight years. And of course, probably the crowning achievement is the 1988 founding with you and your partners yeah. of, of BlackRock, right? It's been an incredible journey. So I'm wondering, where did it start? Maybe you could tell us a little about your early years growing up and did you have any early influencers or mentors? Sure. Well, first of all, Warren, thank you for the role that I Capital plays. Uh, we're a very proud partner of your organization, but we're a willing provider to help it. And we're very excited watching it grow and to the position that I Capital is today. So congratulations thank on you. that. My journey, um, I think my journey was was a, was typical America. My father was in World War II. He was raised in in Michigan. He decided he wanted to, to with a GI Bill. He was able to get a college education. He went and moved to California, and with a GI Bill, he uh, was able to go to UCLA. You know, my mother there, and I would say it was a very traditional journey for so many people of that time. And we lived in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, you know, very solid middle class. Um, I was raised in one house my whole life. We went to public school. At that time, the LA City schools were great. Uh, very good education, as was in, when I went off to UCLA too. Growing up in Los Angeles in the 50s and 60s was truly amazing. Yeah. But my parents were huge influencers in my life as they looked back at my life, my, my parents, um, believed in America. They believed in the opportunity that the country offered. And my parents were, um, I would say they were, they, they lived very frugally throughout their whole lives. And my father worked, my mother worked, and they were just giant savers. Yeah. And in that, in that journey, uh, my father believed in investing in the industrialization, the transformation of America, the blossoming of America post-World War II, the opening of the West in, yep. in California and Los Angeles. Um, and my father was just a consistent investor. And I you know, always remember my father looking at the stock pages and, mm -hmm. and studying that and investing. And quite frankly, a lot of it was pretty foreign to me, but... It was, you know, when he looked back and, okay, he looked for him then, but obviously it had an influence on in me. And yep. So what was your first job? Do you remember? Working for my father at the shoe store. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I spent a lot of time working at the shoe store, but then I worked in pet stores and worked at other okay. things like that. But, but my parents gave me that, that encouragement to try to be financially independent and because they were not going to provide it. Yep. For instance, my parents said, you know, we expect you to work. You know, whether work at the, at the shoe store or find something else. I mean, we're not going to support all your extra spending. But also my parents gave, maybe it was the trust they had in me. I don't know if I would have had the same trust. Um, my, myself and one of my close friends, we went to Hawaii by ourselves at 15 and did things that I could not imagine my kids would have done or even been allowed to at 15 years old. We went right. to Hawaii by ourselves. And uh, we, we slept where we could find a place to sleep. And, but it was that independent spirit that the parents gave us in the, in, in the trust. So actually, when you're, when you're doing this, it gives you a little more confidence in yourself, maybe a little more drive in yourself. You know, I think that was one of the critical elements for me. Um, and then when I, went, when, I, when I went to undergraduate at UCLA, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I mean, my parents were heavily educated. They believed in education. Um, I started thinking about, you know, maybe I want to follow my mother's footsteps. Maybe I want to become a, you know, a professor. Or, uh, maybe I, you know, I definitely want to go to grad school. Um, and at this time, especially, as you know, in back in those days, if you wanted to work in most financial firms, you needed to go... Get your undergraduate degree, work for a few years, go back getting in your MBA. And I said, I don't want to do that. As a senior uh, at 
uh, you know, at school, I was able to secure a research job, even as an undergraduate. And through that, you know, I became quite interested in, okay, pursuing my MBA. In fact, when I was getting my MBA back then, I was probably on average four years younger than the average mm -hmm. individual who was going to getting their MBA. And then, and, and so a lot of it was I mean, maybe the self-drive and the self-determination that I had, um, that, it, that my parents blossomed in me because they didn't force that upon me. Yep. And through that lens of being a research assistant, you know, getting to know more academics, they used to play squash with one of my finance professors. And he had a whole background in Wall Street and the SEC, worked at the SEC at that time, at one time. And he was one that said, you should be focusing on, on Wall Street. Yep. And, and, and quite frankly, growing up in L.A., I was pretty for it. I, I mean, obviously, I knew the stock market. and all the, yep. but, I, but through that, and then he actually introduced me to the partner of Goldman Sachs at that time of the L.A. office. Who was that? Lloyd Stockhell. Okay. And Lloyd, though, said, I liked you. I don't want to ever see you again because you know nothing about this industry. <laughs> he said, I want you to, you know, if you could prove to me that you're interested in this industry, I'll interview you. Yeah, well, you've more than proved it, yeah. I would say. And yeah. I, it's probably a, an interesting segue to what you've built here. Yeah. So you're managing over $10 trillion in assets. I think the firm has close to $110 billion market cap. Last year, you did almost $18 billion in revenue which is incredible. And I'm just wondering, you know, when you were building the company, when you were starting the company, what were you trying to build? And could you imagine at that point in time, this is what would have happened? You know, as you know, when you start a company, what you worry about is survival. Okay. <laughs> you're not worrying about uh, or thinking about the future as much as people think it. Every day mattered. Uh, every client experience mattered. Um, interconnectivity with your partners and friends within the firm mattered. The incrementalism of building an organization, about building a culture, building a team. When we founded the company with seven other partners in May, you could look back and say, it's, if somebody said, can you replicate BlackRock again? That may be, but I, 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 it would be fair to say I could not replicate a team like we had yep. in the original eight partners. We were all able to finish each other's sentences. We all had a, a similar vision. We all were willing to open up the mail yeah. or, or do whatever you needed to do to improve the firm. I mean, it was, it was, it was a team. So that, that sort of makes me think of culture. I've often thought that a great culture is a massive competitive advantage for mm -hmm. a company. So when you were building the firm together, what were the key tenants of that culture? And, and how do you think the culture has evolved as you've gotten so large? <clears throat> Great question. Well, um, so much of BlackRock was developed from the ashes of my career at First Boston. <laughs> you know, so I, I tell everybody, you know, the most important experience is how do you deal with failure? Yep. Dealing with success is, I mean, obviously, you know, that, that's a much easier thing to deal with. I mean, some people have success and go to their head. Yeah. So I'm not trying to say... There's not pitfalls with success, but the most important thing: how do you deal with failure? How do you rebuild? How do you, how do you, um, how do you correct whatever the behaviors were for that failure? So much of the drive and motivation was really we were not going to replicate what we had yep. prior. Um, and back in 1988, very few people would leave big firms. I mean, I, you know, only a handful of startups, and that was yep. a very rare time and you know so so much of the things we did was probably out of innocence too so one of the strong foundations where all eight of us had the same common belief in what the culture can be it's, it is about team the clients come first at everything you do yep. and it wasn't bs it wasn't talk we walked the talk every day and one of the essence of the foundation of the firm 25 percent of the founders came from technology 
and no one talked about technology in 1988. Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. You know, the failure at First Boston for me was we did not have proper risk analytics. Yep. We probably should have been fired when we made all this darn money. <laughs> and then when we lost money in a quarter, everybody became alerted and, and, and we found out there was no real team there. This was, we were just hired guns. When you make money, they love you. When you lose money, you're, you know, you're not a partner. Right, right. And, and a lot of people have experienced the same thing in their respective large firms. Yep, yep. And so one of the lessons I learned and one of the statements I said to myself, we will never not know what we're doing. Yep. And so- Good advice. <laughs> and so we said, we're going to start an investment firm that understands risk, that we're going to develop risk technology. And quite frankly, when I, we used to say risk management in 1988, the, the, the next question was, are you an index fund? Right. Because no one managed risk and no one understood the concept of using technology to help you understand risk. So I think something like 35% of your initial population were in fact technologists. Yes. And, and technology has been so critical to your growth. I mean, Aladdin is the world's largest risk management platform. That's it. Point. And growing even faster now. ETFs, technology, the technology all technology. ETFs is, is about, you know, creating this opportunity for people to invest in whatever they want. So we, we've lowered the fees in ETFs now over 30, 40% of the ETFs and our margins are the same. Yeah. So that's just thinking about the productivity that you, you are around technology. But getting back to culture, and, yep, and sure. the scale, that's probably the hardest thing we ever had to do. Yep. It is so easy to manage a firm with a tight-knit group. Yep. It is very easy to manage a firm if we're all on the same floor. You manage, you can manage by fear. Yep. You can manage by example. But when you start spreading out, even moving to a second floor, you lose line of sight. You lose line of sight. Probably the most landmark thing for me as a manager was the time we bought Merrill Lynch Investment Management. So this is, you know, we're already a public firm now, but before we bought Merrill Lynch Investment Management, we had three offices. So we were, you know, the line of sight was gone, but we still had controllable sight. Yep. yep. And when we bought Merrill Lynch Investment Management that had like 25 offices, that became probably the moment where my actual management behaviors had to change or I was not going to be able to be CEO. And I would say all the leaders' behaviors had to be changed or, you're, or you're, they're not going to be running their divisions. And this is one of the biggest issues I find today talking to young startup companies, how do they expand geographically yep. and, and globally? And this is where it becomes very difficult how do you manage the matrix when you're geographically dispersed? And how do you build a culture that you have to do some matrixing yep. because you have product, you have region, you have clients. All of that just overlays a complexity that is entirely different. You have to learn to be a leader through inspiration. If you're not an inspirational leader within your firm, you're not going to have the followers. Yep. And keep in mind, you have distance time zones when you're a broad firm. And to me, these are the most difficult times in a, in a firm's existence. When you have line of sight leadership, it's so easy. Yep. But when you are now global, broad based, and for us, it happened with one transaction, that was a real learning experience for me. How do you how do you inspire 16,000 employees? How do you make sure that everybody is following the same code, yep. the same playbook? How do you make sure that the way we are representing ourselves with every client worldwide is consistent? Yep. And I think this is the difference between a good firm and a bad firm and a good firm and a great firm. Those firms that can have a culture of connectivity a culture of connectiveness and inclusiveness. Uh, obviously, every good firm has to have high integrity. Yep. All the firms have to have high intellectual content, but it's it's more than that. It is about wrapping those two major themes around the creativity and a culture. Yep. This is the secret sauce of BlackRock. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you obviously care deeply about that. And I think that part of the inspirational piece is just 
your employees realizing how much you care about it. Yeah. Even if you don't make every decision exactly the right way, if they think it's inspired by your desire to have the right culture, I think the organization rallies around that. Yeah. It's, it's very powerful. We all have to be walking the talk. And I get to see some really great companies and some really bad ones. And I get to see, you know, there's one company I remember that I was walking into the lobby. And in the lobby, in the, the single tenant building, oh, they could do it. In the lobby, in marble were the 10 principles of the company. And I paused and read it. And I knew the company fairly well. And I said, well, they don't do that. They don't do that. They don't do that. <laughs> and, and I always said, you know what? Principles are not to be etched in principles. They have to be lived. Yep. Yep. That's great advice. So you wrote in your letter this year that if you had been an investor, you're celebrating your 25th anniversary this year of your IPO. And you wrote in the letter that if... if oh, if an investor bought our shares? If, you bu- if they bought your shares then and held it to the time of your letter, they'd have a 9,000% return, right? Comparing to a 450% S&P return. So that's incredible. And and I'm wondering, Larry, on, on a personal level, like when you've brought the company to where, where it's at today and you've had that kind of financial return, what still inspires you every day to get out and kill it and take the firm to the next level? Well, I see so many opportunities. Actually, I see more opportunities for BlackRock today than I did back then. There's a greater need for public-private. There's a great need for decarbonization. There's a great need uh, for energy security. There's a great need for digitization. So to, to fulfill all this, we're talking trillions of dollars. Yep. And so the opportunity there is great. The other thing I wrote about, which I'm so passionate about it, when I talk to governmental leaders worldwide, they're so envious of the U.S. capital markets. One of the reasons why we have still consistent elevated inflation is it takes longer for the United States to have an impact on the economy with elevated interest rates because we, as a society, have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage market. Yep. Okay. So all the homeowners in America generally have a pretty low coupon mortgage. They're not affected by the Federal Reserve's actions. They're not affected at all. Unlike in most places in the world, the mortgages are five-year resets. So about 20% of each mor- a year yeah. resets. And this is the opportunity for BlackRock. The opportunity we have is to help other countries start building their capital markets. I've had conversation with many governmental leaders on how you know they want to build their own capital markets. That's linked to starting their own defined contribution plan. That's linked to starting a retirement system what I always say is a great society needs a strong banking system and a, and a strong capital market system. If you can continue to innovate on behalf of clients and solve more problems to solve a really serious issue related to retirement, um, you know, you're going to win more share wallet. So that's a, that to me, that's like a legacy issue. You wrote about this obviously in your letter and you told a story of like people not only considering but needing to innovate to help people retire in dignity. And you yep. talked about your, your parents and yep. their retirement yep. experience. Yep. Maybe talk about life path paycheck. What is it and how do you think it plays a role in, in retiring with dignity? Well, for the average person, a defined benefit plan is far better than because they had certainty. Certainty. Okay, my parents had, my mother had a defined benefit plan and they had certainty for retirement from that. They also had certainty for health care. But because the liability was on corporations, they wanted the rid of that liability, and we created a high contribution platform. Yep. And I wrote in my letter, we spend so much time focusing on health, we don't spend any time focusing on, can we afford health, longevity, can we afford all this? And the fundamental problem of defined contribution was we're, we're putting the liability on an individual without them having the f- real resources to do it. So over the years, we created more certainty in the defined contribution business by creating what we call target date funds. Yep. And we said, why don't we try to add even more certainty by wrapping an annuity product so the narrowly of outcomes are, are, is quite narrow, mm-hmm. but more importantly, it's not, it's not identified through a lump sum payment. It's identified saying, we're going to give you a monthly paycheck, a mo- like, a, like a defined benefit blind it did. Yep. And so we're annuitizing your, your lifelong retirement plan 
And so we're giving, you're getting a monthly paycheck from the annuity rider. You can build your life around that predictably. Well, and we have using technology, we can show you as an individual, if you add $10 more a month to your retirement, well, this is the end of the outcome. The other thing is it can show you, okay, should I retire at 60 or 62 or 65 or 67 or 70? We then show you how much more money you have if you delayed retirement. We're trying to elevate financial literacy for this for the average person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Using your scale to provide a real solution. I think more people, when they, they have more certainty about can they, you know, can they live with dignity during retirement? How much money are they going to earn? And you intersect that with how much money you're going to get from Social Security. And you could add that up and say, okay, here's what you're going to be earning. So we're trying to solve a really big problem. So we've been talking about your letters uh -huh. and you're not only the chairman and CEO of BlackRock, but you're also on, on or I've been on boards of the World Economic Forum, the Council on Foreign Relations. Yes. So when you write your letters, the world is listening. Sure. And so I'm curious in that context, how do you think about what to write? What is the oh. process you go through to come up with the, the narrative? It's letter? awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. And it truly is um, daunting. Yeah. When I come back from my annual fly fishing trip in August, I got to start thinking about, okay, what am I going to write about? Yep. What am I gonna, what is topical? What, what makes sense? What's going on? And there's some years where I'm pretty inspired, but last year I was lost. You know, obviously my letters have received a lot of, a lot of success and, but a lot of negativity, uh, by some people, um, and so, you know, I, I want to make sure what I'm doing is very additive. Paid theme? Were you the, paid I, I, I had came in with a couple of themes. We need to talk about this and write about it. And I'm going to develop some output of that. And I look right at it and that's nah, just not resonating with me. Yeah. Yeah. It's not what I want. So it's, it's, it's kind of torturous. <laughs> um, you know, when I first wrote, wrote the letters, no one cared about them. And now, you know, there's a lot of anticipation in these things. Yes. It creates the pressure. But really in the last, this past year, this whole idea of capital markets, that came from my meetings. I made a statement to our shareholder maybe a year earlier, we were going to be more active at acquisition. Mm -hmm. Everybody assumed we were going to go into the private equity business, right? And, right? and all the rumors who was, were buying, I mean- There were many. But not, there was nothing that came up. And we made a conclusion probably in fall, we're, we're going to move ahead in infrastructure, that to me makes the most yep. industrial logic sense for BlackRock is and our clients and where I believe the next J curve, uh, you know, or, or hockey stick curve is going to be. And much of what I wrote about was these macro themes that I, I saw. And then, then the whole idea of retirement. I mean, more and more I was hearing from different governments. I was hearing it from Washington, uh, perils we have with Social Security and now according to, um, I think, the CBO. Social Security Fund will be out of money in 2035. That's a pretty daunting thing for the average person who's, you know, hearing that. They're putting all this money away and they may, they may not have it. Um, and But I would say this was a very hard letter. But I was as pleased with this letter as any letter ever. This letter was very well received, more so than last year. And I, I guess my question is, were you a little surprised by that reaction last year? I'm surprised every year. I, 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 yeah. I'm surprised on a, on a negative side, on a positive side. I don't know what it's going to be received. I mean, you know, I was, now fortunately, I do review this these letters with my board. I yep. do review them with all my partners. And so I already get some mixed reviews. <laughs> I don't get uniform. Oh, this is great, Larry. Um, and, uh, I did feel, Lawrence, that uh, these themes of retirement, infrastructure, capital markets, deficits were touching where I believe the world has to go. Yeah. And I believe that's what caught the attention. It was very heartfelt, too. And, and yeah. I think you were, the way you described your parents' yeah. experience yeah. as part of that, as always being an inspiration for looking at the problem both as it relates to retirement, but also the power of the capital markets, which you discussed, I, I think was was a very powerful way to convey that. And let's keep in mind, I write about, I'm trying to write about things that we don't talk about. We don't talk enough about perils of retirement because it's not a, it's not a today problem. 
yeah, it's a future problem, but it's being heartfelt by more and more Americans, by more and more people. And so it really is a today problem, and we're not talking about it. Our governments are not talking about retirement. Yeah. How do you, with all the stress that you're under in this seat, how do you keep yourself fresh? How do you keep yourself balanced and able to function at your Well, best? first, you have to love your job. You have to, you have to love your partners. And I'm blessed. I have a job that is, that changes every day. I have a job that, uh, it validates me in most days, <laughs> not every day. Uh, it's a job that I just truly enjoy my partners. And in this part of my career, I really do enjoy watching the next generational leaders yep. um, growing and hopefully, you know, one or two or three of them will be the next generational leaders of the firm. Uh, let me restate that they better be. <laughs> and uh, so I'm inspired by that. Uh, but I do have a pretty good ability to turn off. Yep, that's good. Because if there may be nights where I can't sleep, but it is not because I'm thinking about work. I shut down work easily. I mean, I could truly go from a really hard day having dinner within an hour shutting down, uh, let them home. That's a gift. Um, yeah, I could. You can't, if you don't have that gift, I don't think you could survive. Yeah, I really don't believe it. I think that's an underappreciated gift for anybody who's in leadership. Being a CEO of a large company that has um, that has a role in society is a big responsibility. And as the largest retirement manager in the world, I mean, we live that responsibility every day. I mean, if, yep. if we do not do our job, we're hurting a lot of people. That is an understood pendant of BlackRock. The responsibility that we have is enormous. You know, having $10.5 trillion of money entrusted in us, none of it is our money, but we don't earn it every day, live it every day with decency, integrity, with proper analytical systems, with the proper checks and balances. If we don't have that, we're gonna fail. Yep. And this is one of the beauty of being a public company. You know, there are a lot of hard things about it being a public company, but let, you know, and probably the the negative and the positive is the transparency of being a public company forces you to have even more elevated behaviors. Yep. Um, because you're so worried about the transparency of everything. And look at, and this is getting back to culture. I mean, one of the things that everybody knows when they come into my office, and they, you know, generally they come to the office, and if they have bad news. That be, but it'd be the first thing out of your mouth. Yeah, bad news first. And uh, I want a culture of leadership that runs into fires. If I see a leader who's running away from a fire, they're they're not they're not at the firm yep. in the future. Our job as a successful company is to build an organization that has a culture of identification of problems. It's very easy to have a, a moment of success. And you know, the, the tide does rise with everything when you have big successes. Yeah. But the differentiation between a good firm and a bad firm is all about how do you identify problems? How do you fix them? How do you remediate them? Yeah. So I have one last question. Um, I, I have a personal philosophy that, you know, it's the simple things in life that make the difference. And I think a lot of what we need to do in our lives to be successful we learned as five-year-olds with our parents. <laughs> say please, say thank you, yeah. appreciate, share your things. And I'm wondering in your leadership mindset, do you have a simplifying philosophy that you, know, you use to run your life in the, in the business? I think this is one of the foundational purposes of all the eight founders. But I could honestly tell you, when we started this company, making money was not an objective. We really had a view that building an organization that we're proud of that will outlive us is far better than having you know, an objective of making money. Making money is an outcome, not an objective. Yep. And I try to pass that on to my children. You know, do what you're doing, passion, you do it well, making money happens. But if you are driving your, your life, your job, for the purpose of making money, you're gonna fail. It is about building and deeply focus on on you know the responsibilities and 
And if you do it really well, the outcome of financial gains is great. Yeah. But yeah. it can't be an objective. It starts with improving the outcomes for others. And that's the difference between, as you know, from a former Wall Street side, this is why I love the buy side, because it is all about outcomes. It is not about the f velocity of money. Yeah. I mean, banking, m much of it is about just clicks, making money, velocity of money. And it's a great business model. So I'm not trying to suggest it's a bad one, but it was not a business model that I ultimately liked for myself. And I wanted to have a business model that was entirely on the outcomes of investing. Yeah, that's great. Larry, thank you so much thank for your time today. I really you. appreciate it. Great. Yep. You too. Once again, my profound thanks to Larry for generously sharing his time and personal journey with us. His leadership and vision have not only shaped BlackRock, but have also had profound impact on the broader financial industry. Thank you for being part of this conversation at the 19th hole.